Hey there, Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel finding dodo birds and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent. If you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, knock that out while you're here. Today, we are continuing our conference previews for the 2022-23 college basketball season. We've already done the American, the ACC, the Big East, the Big Ten and the Big 12. Now we're turning our attention to the Pac-12, where UCLA and Arizona project to finish as the top two teams in the league for the second straight season. Last season, it was Arizona first, UCLA second. This season, I have it UCLA first, Arizona second. First question, dead leg. Who you taking first in the Pac-12 this season? UCLA, Arizona, or somebody else? Come on, man. What are we doing here? What are you doing? Uh, I think I've labeled it a Pac-12 preview. All right. Our listeners know the deal. All right. If you've been tuning into all these conference previews, appropriately so, I believe it was the, I believe it was the ACC preview where we got to the content people needed that they wanted, they were craving, and that is what's the better Dakota, North or South Dakota? <laughs> South Dakota in a runaway. I'll note, by the way. And I told you at the end of that episode that when we got to the Pac-12, we would be litigating the great debate of North Carolina versus South Carolina. So that is where we will start. We are men of our words on this mm -hmm. podcast. Here's what I got. Nada's going to chime in in a bit here, too, because he is a resident of the northern state. So North Carolina, South Carolina, who you got? Here's what I got. North Carolina, it's got Kitty Hawk, Wright Brothers Museum, OBX. You ever done a vacation on OBX? Get the big house rental? Done it a couple times. Why? Big fan. I've rented big houses, but I don't know anything about OBX. OBX, good, good time, although you avoid going in and out on a Sunday, if at all possible. Traffic is an absolute nightmare. It'll take away half your day there. Uh, it's a great, great, great basketball state. Might even make claim to be the best basketball state in the nation in terms of fandom. You got the Triangle. You got all that. You got the Smoky Mountains elite area. You ever been to Smoky Mountains? I've been of course, there. Of course I've been to the Smoky Mountains. Great. Uh, I mean, it truly might be like top three underrated spots in the country to go to and spend a vacation. You got Asheville in that area, you know, very good, you know, brewery scene, elite, you know, indie, indie vibes for a, for a small American city, but growing, uh, it's got Pinehurst nine, 18 whole courses. One of them course two, of course, regularly in the rotation for every, uh, for many major championships in golf. Wilmington is an underrated town. Um, it's where Michael Jordan grew up. So that's some of North Carolina. I'm forgetting a few things. I know not all or clear me South Carolina. What do you got? Well, you got Charleston, considered top 10 city in America by many people. I have actually never been to Charleston. You've been, you've been to Charleston? Been to Charleston many times. I've, I've yet to get there, but I, I need to get there. It's like top three on my list. It is guys. great. It's a wonderful place. I, I see, random, random for me. Seattle, Nashville, Charleston. Three cities I haven't been to. That Those are my, like the three I want to get to. Uh, you know, If I could pick. If you tell me tomorrow, you can go to Seattle. Nashville, Charleston, those are the three that uh, that I want to get to. Um, I, think I've, I think I've been to every important American city except for Chester, South Carolina. I'm getting there. And it, uh, South Carolina has Chester, South Carolina. That's a fact. It has the hometown of Devin Downey. That's right. It has the Peach Jam. Ooh. It has Hilton Head. A lot of good golf. There's good golf in North Carolina as well. It's a lot of good golf in South Carolina. Ocean Course, Kiowa Island. Correct. I was... Uh, Bada Bing. It's got Greenville. Great, you know, Greenville, maybe the the uh, the answer to, to Asheville in North Carolina. Great little secret of a city. I was just there earlier this year for the NCAA tournament. And then, you know, Myrtle Beach is a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a hot mess. Maybe a little bit of a party city, but a ton of golf down there as well. So that's just a that's just an initial list. I think I got to tweet this out in real time, by the way. North Carolina versus South Carolina. Where do you, before Nada chimes in, which I think I know his answer. Uh, where do you land here, Parrish? I, I think conventional wisdom would, would tell you North Carolina. You know, it's got a lot of the same uh, stuff. You know, a lot of the stuff that is awesome about South Carolina is also present in North Carolina. And then North Carolina has Charlotte. It's got an NBA franchise. It's got a uh, – that NBA franchise is something else, man. They can't – whoo, them guys. We're going to open that door? Them guys can't get <laughs> – they can't stay out of trouble. That NBA franchise and then the football franchise kind of, you know, they fire their coach, but then they, you know, then they win a big well, that that begs the question, though, hmm. like they are 
North Carolina's professional basketball franchise. But the Carolina Panthers, although based in North Carolina and recently flirting with a move to South Carolina that then got changed, I feel like the Carolina Panthers actually represent both states. Let's bring in Nada. Let's bring in Nada here. Nada, what do we what do we what have we not touched on? And don't worry, we are going to get to the Pac-12 preview. I was starting to worry. We will get to the the Pac-12 preview, but you guys got to stop insulting my home. Like by comparing this to South Carolina, I understand everybody loves Charleston. I understand everyone loves Hilton Head. I get that. But you still have places like Rock Hill, which no one really bothers to go to. And it's a great spot for gas. Congratulations. Let's not compare this. This is like, this is an insult to North Carolina to compare this to South Carolina. I understand how everybody might love South Carolina. Shout out to Devin Downey, but this is really not a contest at all. Not a contest. That that was, that was my, that's what my instincts told me. But then I can't get past the fact that Chester is in South Carolina and that's a lot to, that's a lot for North Carolina to overcome. (sighs) Which is fair. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's not fair. Devin, again, Chester, South Carolina, there's a lot there. There's it's the home of it's the home of Devin Downey, and they have uh, Kiowa Island. That's a, that's some good stuff there. Big time. That's big time. Not I think it's closer than you're than you're indicating it should be. Sir, the only time I go to South Carolina now, now is to go get gas for a decent price. That's it. <laughs> gas is important. It is. It is important. Uh, try uh, the Triangle area, Nada. Overrated, underrated, or just right. Because I know they'll listen, and, and specifically obvious. Uh, no, it's very overrated over, up there. Very overrated. Raleigh, Durham, the whole Chapel Hill. It's a good area. Not I'm going to lean North Carolina time, just so we're clear. I'll lean OBX has put me over the top. Love OBX. Okay, so there we go. It's our North Carolina portion of the Pac-12 preview. Yeah, I feel like that I was about it's, it's a four, sweet. I think it was about four minutes too long. Nah, that's all right. People, people are enjoying it. North Carolina has the giant Charlotte I'm airport. Not sure. Flying through, you know, don't even get me started about flying through Charlotte. Don't even get me started about flying through Charlotte. They got nice rocking chairs at that I airport. Know, they got though. the rocking chairs. I don't think I've ever had a quick layover. I, I don't think I've ever landed in Charlotte for a layover and it's been like, you're just the next, you're the next gate over. No, that ain't happening. It's all, it's like Atlanta. It's always a haul. It's always a haul. But you can stop uh, at Bojangles. It's true. Atlanta okay. Airport, I have had like land at B thirty two, depart at B thirty one. Like I've done that before. It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. Uh, you, you feel like you won a lottery. That is a lot. That is exactly what that is. Because I've also landed. I got to get on another plane in fifteen minutes, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sprinting. I'm sprinting. Home alone scene. Here we go. Pac twelve preview storylines to know. UCLA Arizona obviously at the top, but. Well, Arizona, after losing three pros, you know, you get, how about this? You lose three pros, Benedict Matherin, Dalen Terry, Christian Coloco. You get a one seed in your first season at a top 10 type of program. That recalibrates a lot of things for you, your staff, your administration, your fan base. I'll be interested to see what Arizona can build over the next five months in year two under Tommy Lloyd. I think that's the biggest headline going in. Three more storylines to know. UCLA, how about this? Has not won a league title of any kind in nine years. Does the drought end in 2023? Will UCLA trade Mick Cronin for Gary Parrish for a day and let Parrish coach a game while, you know, Cronin joins the pod to talk about the New York Mets and premarital sex? If this happens, will anybody even notice the difference? Storyline three, the Pac-12 has averaged three and a half bids the past four NCAA tournaments. Can it exceed that number? and it prove its reputation this season. I'm a bit dubious on that. And then last one, there are no new coaches in this league. It's the only power conference where that is true of the 22-23 season. There was no coaching change at the head spot across all 12 schools, but there are coaches potentially facing the plank. Jared Haas at Stanford, Bobby Hurley at Arizona State, Mike Hopkins at Washington. Uh, if you really even wanted to make a case that maybe potentially Mark Fox, maybe, but I don't know if I buy that. And then uh, I'll get to Oregon State at the very end there, but Wayne Tinkle recently signed an extension and it is Oregon State, so I don't think um, he's facing a hot seat here. So those are the big stories as we head into an intriguing but a bit mysterious Pac-12 season. So the Pac-12 only got three schools in the NCAA tournament last season. Will it do better than that this season? I would assume so. We'll talk about that next. But first, a word 
from our partners. The UEFA Champions League on Paramount Plus. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, exhilaration. That's brilliant! With Mo Magic and more drama. While a former Bavarian nails the back of the net in Barcelona, an American trades his stars with zebra stripes, and a Norwegian creates sky blue spectacles. So stream every sweat, so second of regulation time, stoppage time, and extra time. Beyond magnificent! This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live exclusively on Paramount Plus. Only three schools got the NCAA tournament out of the Pac-12 last season. It was Arizona, UCLA, USC. None of them advanced past the Sweet 16. They're like, surely, surely the Pac-12 is going to get more than three teams in the 2023 NCAA tournament, right? Surely, not surely. Uh, I, yeah. will, I will take the over, uh, sure. but I will not say surely. Not, I, I will say it. I'll say it again. Surely. Okay. Tell I'll me. say it one more time. Surely. Mm, all right, here's your top my top four in order i got your top four too i brought up our pac-12 preview on the cbs sports app we're identical we both got ucla going one mm-hmm. arizona two oregon three usc four then we start to uh then we start to get cute and, and split in our different ways so we'll get to that in a minute so let's go let's talk those four teams in order as we both have them ucla number one i'm i, I like them as a comfortable number one here um, because I think Tiger Tiger Campbell, I think is going to be like a top three to five point guard in the sport this season. He's just an outright stud, uh, doesn't turn the ball over. There are very few players in the country that have his experience started more than 90 games, you know, taken a team to the final four, um, been, you know, the lead guard of a power conference program for as long as he has, I think that winds up meaning a ton to this team, not to mention, obviously, Jaime Jaquez. Jaquez was a preseason first-team All-America that we announced last season, I mean, last season, last uh, last week at CBSSports.com. And I do think Jaquez is the team's best player, uh, but this could be a classic example of, you know, Jaquez is the team's best player. Maybe we look up Narch and, and really Campbell's the most important one. They've got some interesting new talent coming in. I'll let GP hit on that. But I, I do think that Cronin is going to have the best team, and we will finally see UCLA after going uh, really a decade without winning a regular season or postseason Pac-12 title. I think that ends this year. They've got, a, they've got enough returning and enough good talent coming in that it just seems to make sense that they kind of continue along and maybe they wind up thriving more this season than last when they were widely picked to be a top five group after making the final four, they fell just short of that, but they had, a, they obviously had a satisfactory season before going down in the sweet 16 in North Carolina. Yeah. I like this team a lot. They, they lose two of their top three scores plus a one and done freshman still the obvious pick in the pack 12. I think because of the return of tiger Campbell, who is not only a, 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 a steady, steady, uh, lead guard, but is also a legitimate threat from the three-point line. He shot 41% from three uh, last season. You bring back Hami Hakez as well. Um, like you said, first-team CBS Sports uh, All-America guard. And then they enroll a couple of five-star guys, I think most notably uh, Amari Bailey, who you know should be able to score right from – the jump, um, you know, what UCLA people will tell you is that Johnny Juzang was a terrific college player, um, but they don't think him not being there this season is going to be that big of a deal because Amari Bailey can probably get uh, a, a lot of those buckets. And then the other five-star, Dean Bonema, is, uh, you know, a, a five-star big who Mick Cronin has been very complimentary of uh, this offseason. So, yeah, UCLA lost some familiar faces, some important pieces, but on paper at least, that's still clearly to me. I'm with you on this. Clearly, that the uh, the team that should be projected to to win the Pac-12, although for whatever it's worth, um, if you go to the Ken Palm preseason numbers, mm-hmm. um, Arizona is actually 10th in the country, one spot ahead of UCLA, which is 11. Um. If if UCLA fans are aware of this, but if you're a Pac-12 fan or college hoops fan and you have not seen uh, Bailey's a good good talent could be uh, fantastic. If you've not seen Bona play, he I almost put him on my top 100 list, and I, he's like there's sometimes each year when we do this, there are like three to five guys where I'm like, man, I'm not putting him on the list, but he could be like a top 60 player. Bona is a, a menace, man, 
uh, very athletic, uh, decided between UCLA or Kentucky. He picks the Bruins, and I think that's going to be the boon. That'll be what leads to UCLA winning the league. He could be uh, just an outstanding freshman for what he does at both ends of the floor, runs it well, and just plays composed but unafraid. And, and the buzz coming out of UCLA is he's he's been uh, as good of a player um, in the preseason as anyone else on the roster. So I'm I'm really excited to see what he can do and what he looks like on uh, on that team as they as they really get as they get rolling there. Um, Arizona, okay, lose the three NBA picks, but whatever. They they're going to bring back Julius Tabellis, who's going to be high quality, probably the best player on the team. Pell Larson has been getting a lot of of. Good pub, good discussion, if you will. I think he's going to be maybe the breakout player in the entire conference. Uh, Kirk Creesa, we love him on this podcast because he's just unafraid to talk crap to anyone. And he takes crap from no one. I mean, he's taunting the TCU student section or fan section after uh, TCU gave Arizona everything it could handle in the NCAA tournament. And Kirk Kreese is just, uh, you know, he's his typical self there. Might get him to a little bit of trouble this season. Maybe, maybe not. But I like the fact that we have such a great character. And that's what Kreese is, in addition to being a pretty damn good player as well. They're also going to have Omar Balo, who has been a player that has been promising, but has not really produced anything for his entire college career going back to Gonzaga. He should be starting in the front court alongside Tabellis this season. After what Arizona did last season under Lloyd, yes, with all of Sean Miller's players. I get that, but Lloyd did a, did a hell of a job there. Um, I do like them as a clear cut number two. I, I like UCLA just a barely a notch above Arizona going in, going in and then Arizona on its own shelf there as well. Transfer to know is Courtney Ramey who comes by way of Texas. And it's really Ramey's addition that gives me confidence that Arizona is going to have a good shot at maintaining a top 20 status overall and should easily. And I mean, easily, uh, you know, qualify, be it automatic bid or at large and getting into the tournament there. I think these two teams yet again will be the top two in the conference. Yeah, Courtney Ramey started 106 games at Texas, so he has um, consistently played uh, a prominent role in a power conference. His transition should go rather smoothly. Be interested to see if Cedric Henderson Jr. Um, can have an impact as well. He's a transfer from Campbell. It's my little homie from Memphis. Arizona gets him and a, a five-star freshman in Kylan Boswell. Um, you know, you you they lost a lot. I'd be surprised if, if Arizona is as good as it was last season, if only because it was, you know, probably one of the four or five best teams in the country last season. Um, but I still think it's a preseason top 20 team and um, a, a, a likely NCAA tournament participant. After that, uh, we both have Oregon. And by the way, just uh, for people who might be curious, I've got UCLA 10th in the top 25 and one, Arizona 17th. And then I have Oregon 22nd as the third and, and last Pac-12 team I, I have in the top 25 and one. They're returning the Ducks, three of the top six scores. Um, among them, Will Richardson, Quincy Garrier. You know, Richardson is terrific. He uh, is a 39% career three-point shooter he averaged a little more than 14 points per game you know Dana Altman last season missed the NCAA tournament for just the second time since 2012 it was a bit of a mess they had pretty good preseason expectations and just for a variety of reasons that team never um you know hit a good place although they did they did I think start like nine and three in the Pac-12 um, it just, uh, you know, it, it, it broadly speaking didn't go well, but this should be a, a, a bounce back season. Um, they add a five star, you know, uh, prospect in uh, Killer Ware. Uh, they get a junior college, all American, a, a transfer from Colorado. There's enough pieces there for Oregon, uh, I think, to to challenge UCLA and Arizona at the top of the Pac-12. And and I would assume safely make the NCAA tournament. Uh, they should be in. Uh how would we how would we define safe single digit seed? I, th I think that's a fair descriptor. Right? I, I think if you're going into your conference tournament and you can lose your first game and you are still in the bracket, nobody's you know Jerry Palm's not putting you on the wrong side of anything. I think then then that's safely making the NCAA tournament. If you're not sweat, if if nobody says now Oregon really needs to win this first game or else it could get mm -hmm. dicey, then you're safely yeah. in the tournament. It's not even yeah, it's not even on the table there. I'd agree with that. That should be Oregon's situation. Where is a stretchy seven footer? who I think should add a good dynamic piece playing alongside and Folly Dante, who I think is going to probably be and have, a, he's going to be the best version of himself. He'll have the best season. I think he's had 
in college there. And then Gary is a nice piece there. Yeah. So yeah, Oregon makes sense as the third team overall. Um, I would put their range anywhere between uh, six seed and 11 to be over, to be honest. Uh, and then we've got USC in the four spot. You know, they don't have the Mobley era is over. Evan Ooh, Mobley, Isaiah that's Mobley that's done. Okay. They went, they both NBA picks and yeah, a Conwu also an NBA pick. Um, I reported, uh, I guess, a month ago at this point. I don't even know if we ever talked about it on the podcast or not. But in early July, you know, the next great USC big man uh, scarily collapsed, had cardiac failure, Vince Iwuchukwu. Uh, he, they were just running drills, and thankfully he was sitting down when it happened, so he didn't, uh, he didn't uh, fall all the way down from a standing up position, which is, which is really fortunate there. He was in the hospital for... Th- three days i think it was and you know this is a this was a five-star prospect in the 247 sports composite Uh, certainly was a guy coming in that was considered to be someone that would you know keep usc in the chase for the pac-12 title that he has not been cleared and there's no assurance that he will be cleared Uh, i still like usc overall in the scheme of the pac-12 without him but not having him uh, just it, it unfortunately it demotes usc's prognostication the most important thing is that he remains okay and you know i i got him on record when i did the story about a month ago and he's you know as i understand it like he's been cleared to like ride a bike you know the stationary bike and do that stuff but he you know and i haven't checked in honestly in the past two and a half three weeks but i, I would not imagine this the situation has, has drastically changed all that much but he's not you know he's not doing drills he's not running up and down the floor like there, there. He has got a, a, a personal uh, staff of health advisors, doctors that are looking at him, and then USC obviously does as well. And they're going to be extremely cautious with this. So we wait and see if he even gets to play. GP. Sounds like sounds like he's going to be um, a candidate for Big Twelve Newcomer of the Year next season. That's certainly referring to Keontae Johnson, of course, who's going to be at Kansas State. Yeah, that could wind up being the case. Yeah, you, uh, that's what you if you can't get cleared to play. Um, in the SEC or the Pac-12, or let you go to the Big 12, and there's there. I mean, I'm not even being goofy here. Like, there's there's multiple examples in recent years True. of people with heart issues, yes, um, tr- can't get cleared at their schools, but go to Big 12 schools and get cleared. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, or I have no opinion on it. I'm not a doctor. I'm just saying Jarrett Butler couldn't get cleared at Alabama, but he got cleared at Baylor. Keontae Johnson couldn't get cleared at Florida, but he got cleared, I believe. He's cleared at, at yes. Kansas State. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So, yeah, I'm not even that wasn't even a joke. I just if you want to continue your basketball career, if USC isn't willing to to clear you medically, um, there is possibly a place in the Big 12 that will. Uh, any other thoughts on on the Trojans here? We both got them slotted at four heading in, which means we both think like I do think this will be a four bit league at minimum. So we've both got them making the tournament. Yeah, I mean they got Boogie Ellis, leading returning score. Um, you know he averaged 12 and a half points last season. Shot a little more than 30%, 37% from three. He's turned into a really nice college pay, uh, player. Drew Peterson also back, double did score. This is, boy, you want to, time flies? Year 10 for Andy Enville. That's unreal. That's Year crazy, 10. man. That, dude, that's crazy. It, it really is, though. It feels this like Dunk City was season. just, it feels like Dunk City. I don't feel like I've known Amanda Enfield for a decade, but that's where we're at now been aware of her existence for a decade. She was a star of that NCAA tournament. And uh, um, yeah, they're, they're the year. this is year 10 for Andy Enfield. He's coached him for the past six NCAA tournaments, made the Elite Eight in 2021. So he is, I don't know if it's quietly or not so quietly. I don't know. He's just like done a, I remember when he got hired, people were like, never worked in that type, you know, never worked in that part of the country. Really only had one, you know, just do you really hire a guy after a great, couple of weeks and all this stuff and like here we are look think about all the guys who've been hired and fired since andy infield got the usc job that list is is pretty long you should put it together sometime uh i think i'm all right man all right so after that then we start to diverge i've even changed so when i did my pac-12 the pac-12 standings i have on our cbs preview are not what's going to be reflected in my uh overall top 100 rankings that come out later this week so i'm going to go off of my top 100 rankings you've got arizona state five i decided to go with washington state in the five spot here 
Uh, there's going to be – there's going to – once you get to the fifth spot in the Pac-12, five to ten feel as mysterious, foggy, hazy, pick the word, as any power conference in the country, and I mean that. I have little confidence that any of these projections will come true, but I will go with Wazoo at five. Uh, Muhammad Gie is going to be – if Pell Larson's the breakout guy, then – then Guy is number two. He is 6'11", super athletic from Senegal. He is awesome. And he if Kyle Smith really unlocks him, I do think that Washington State, which was a little bit buzzy a season ago, wasn't exactly projected to make the NCAA tournaments, but certainly be a team that that nudged up. Um, and they did they did decently enough for themselves there, finishing 44th in Ken Palm, going 22 and 15. I will have them continuing that and 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 moving on even though they lost some they lost some some good pieces there but i will go wazoo at five and that's the team where really does the pac-12 get as many as five bids cougars if they do it it'll be the first time we talked about this on a recent other conference podcast because why wouldn't we talk about tony bennett's washington state cougars um last time they made it was 09 second longest drought in the country that's right we were talking about DePaul's paul's 04 is the longest one of any power conference team. so i'll go i'll go wazoo at five You've got Arizona State, Bobby Hurley's team, in a hot seat season. Sun Devils sitting at five there. Give us some thoughts on uh, what's going down in Tempe. Bobby Hurley's going to fight his way off the hot seat. That's what Bobby Hurley does. Too much heart. Too much, huh? Not going to let Bobby Har- Hurley sit on the hot seat. All right, That's sell what... me on it. Let's hear it. Okay. Fingers crossed Marcus Bagley finally healthy. Yes. I mean, he's only played 15 games through two seasons. Only played three last season. Um, But, like, he's healthy. They also add Frankie Collins, who didn't do anything or barely anything at at Michigan last season. But he was a top 50 recruit in the class of 2021. So he's talented. Um, Concerning, he didn't really make an impact at Michigan. But, you know, once upon a time, he was considered talented. So so there's, there's two pretty good pieces in theory. Plus, it's Bobby Hurley on the hot seat, and that's not where he lives. He fights his way off of the hot seat. I, here, here's the truth. I, I think the Pac-12 gets four schools in easily. UCLA, Arizona, Oregon, USC. And then I think a fifth gets in, like like 11 seed play-in type yeah. deal. But, it, it, but I, I don't feel strongly about the, the, the fifth team i have them in order and i think it'll be one of these four arizona state stanford washington state washington Mm -hmm. but i I feel out of that group of four one of them will make it but i you know i i I wouldn't make a strong argument for any of the four i just think that ultimately somehow some way the pac-12 will get five and it'll be those top four plus either arizona state stanford washington state washington ASU also has DJ Horn back. He averaged 12 a night last season. And then Desmond Cambridge comes over via Nevada, was a 16 point per game scorer. There's intrigue there. I, I, I'm I just lower on them, but I could, I could well be wrong uh, entirely on that. And yeah, I, I'd like to see a team really scoot up, make some noise. And I actually like the fact that we, I don't think we've diverged more in our projections than we are here in the Pac 12. And that's, that's good. I like a little, uh, I like difference in thought and approach here. We've got Stanford, though. At six, the Cardinal Jared Haas is definitely in a make the tournament or see you later kind of season. This is his seventh season with the Cardinal has yet to make an NCAA tournament. Yeah, yeah, at, the, at the power five level, history says hard. Like, not impossible, but hard. But yeah, you're not going to get a you're almost certainly not going to get an eighth year at a school if you miss the NCAA tournament seven straight years. Yeah, it's it's happened, but it's rare. Uh, and they and what's wild about Stanford, they've never been able to break. They've had like talent there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a five star here and a five star there. Zaire Williams. Um, and that was a weird year. You could almost like toss that. They didn't play on. They didn't play home games. It was like a lot of weird. That was weird for everybody. The 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 COVID year. But it was especially weird for, for Stanford. Um, they, they enroll Harrison Ingram. He was a five star in 2021. He was pretty good last season. Average ten and a half point six point seven rebounds. Projected by some to be like a late first round pick in the 2023 uh, NBA draft. Spencer Jones is back. He was the leading scorer last season. They added Michael um, Michael Jones, who averaged nearly twelve points per game at at at, at Davidson uh, last season. Shot above forty two percent from three. So there's some there's some talent there. I I could actually I agree with you. Jared probably needs to make the NCAA tournament. Um, I, I think he's got a decent chance on paper to, to do it. 
there's a decent chance and yeah harrison ingram could be uh could be a whole whole bunch of fun after that i've you've got washington you've got washington down at eight uh so do i actually so after i kind of reorganized my order so we have them in the same spot um give a shout to the guys at uh at the heat check they tweeted out last night here on sunday night before we taped this podcast uh, that six teams since 2018 have been outside the top 100 in Ken Palm in the preseason and gone on to receive an at-large tournament bid. Uh, if you're curious, I'll give you those six teams real quick. Last season, it was Iowa State and Wyoming outside the top 100. They got at-large bids the year before that. Drake got one. Uh, and then the tournament before 2020, obviously. Belmont and VCU did it, and then NC State did it in 2018. So the question was, who might pull it off this season? Um, I looked at that list. I actually think Washington is the team most likely to do it. If any team outside the preseason top 100, Washington sits at 113 at Ken Palm heading in. Uh, you know, I, I it, clearly Hopkins needs to have a really good season. I think that's 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 obvious there. Um, I do think this team has enough to win 20 or more games. Keon Brooks Jr. from Kentucky is the big time ad, and I think he's going to have a very very good season. Jamal Bay is back. He's a good player. He's just inefficient. He needs to be better. He needs to be he needs to be clearly more efficient. And then uh, Washington State lost Noah Williams, who went you know he uh, went across uh, enemy lines here, and he'll be. He'll be in the backcourt starting there for Washington. That's so, kind of what, like, how often does that happen? I, I, I don't know. Like, I you go from Washington State to Washington. That's like going from Mississippi State to Ole Miss or going from North Carolina to South Carolina is what that's it what is. It's, that's what it's like. It's a, it's a deal. Don't um, even get me started on going from North Dakota to South Dakota. Yeah. Just, um, you know, it's a good pickup for Washington. And I, you know, like, on, you know, so they got Keon Brooks. They got Noah Williams. They've they've got some 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 nice uh, stat. You know, these guys have performed. Yeah. Um, for quality teams, I know Kentucky lost to St. Peter's, but Kentucky is one of the best teams in the country last season, and and Keon Brooks was a double digit score for that team. Washington State was pretty good last season, and and Noah Williams was a, a part of that. Like they, they you know, they, they why should they finish forty fourth at Kinbaum last season? The problem, of course, is that, and this is why I'm a little skeptical of them breaking through this year they lost the top four scores from from that team and that's a lot to overcome we're going to circle back at the end of this podcast I, I put the tweet out about what's the better carolina getting some interesting facts and opinions on this so uh we will we will put a bow on that conversation after we get through the rest of these pac 12 teams there utah i've got finishing above arizona state and below washington uh, but I am more aggressive probably on the Utes than others. Craig Smith has been a pretty good head coach over the course of his career, and I think that he's going to get it figured out there. Uh, they've got a, a, a – this is yet another team where their best player is going to be a big, and that's going to be a, a that's going to be an example across really like 40 teams across the country. Brandon Carlson is a seven-footer who is definitely Utah's best player. Uh, they will probably work from the inside out, but they do have a good versatile wing defender in Marco Anthony uh, who can guard, like truly guard one through four, uh, and will do so not on a nightly basis, but almost on a possession-by-possession possession basis. Uh, Smith and his staff really give him – uh, a lot of leeway to to be a, a help defender, a pickup defender. He is just as reliable as it gets. Utah is Utah and Colorado to me are the two teams where I look at the rosters and I'm like, what are we gonna what are we gonna have here? Like, are you gonna finish sixth? You're gonna finish eleventh? I don't really know. So it is a dart throw with the Utes, but I'll have them, you know, I'll have them finishing eighth, and then I've got Arizona State nine. Yeah, I've got it. I've told you five, six, seven, eight. And then at nine, Colorado added a couple of Ivy League transfers, lost the top three scores from last season, but Ted Bull's pretty reliable. Yeah, he, he, he is. I got him 10. I, I, you know, I don't have him 10 like wantingly, but I, yeah, I don't know, GP. You got him nine. I got him 10. Yeah. Cal lost uh, its top three scores from last season. And then making things worse there, um, Jalen Celestine, who was the leading returning score, he had knee surgery back in the spring. He did not play on the European trip. Um, you know, Mark Fox has indicated that he's almost certainly not going to be ready to start the season. So everything at Cal was going to be hard anyway. Um, it, it gets harder when when that guy's not available for uh, for you for 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 at least a portion of of your non league schedule. So I've got Colorado at nine, Cal at ten, eleven, Utah. Um, you know, they were four and sixteen in the Pac-12 last season. That was the worst record for that program in league um, in like a decade. Um, and then at twelve, Oregon State, which was just woo. I mean, 
three and 28 last season, one and 19 in the Pac 12, finished 233rd at Kempom. Uh, I don't know that any school in America went from a high like the high they had in March 2021 to the low they had really every month in 2022 to date. Correct. I got a thought quick on Oregon State, but just one thing about Cal. Um, they have Devin Askew on the roster. Devin Askew reclassified because John Calipari asked him to, then was not used at Kentucky. Okay. Then he goes to Texas, was just as lost in the mix at Texas as he was. I'm just hoping that Devin Askew, a former top 40 prospect who's still relatively young, uh, can find nice footing and build out a nice career in Berkeley. Um, I, that's something that, that I'm keeping an eye on at Cal. I have Cal 11, then I have Oregon State 12. Oregon State has not won in 2022. Okay. This. It is truly amazing. They were sometimes teams are bad. And you just never talk about them. Oregon State was so bad. And we did talk about them in the pod a couple times. Shouts to Beaver Fever. They were so bad that they deserved more conversation. It is not just the worst follow up season to an Elite Eight appearance in history. By far, previous record, Boston College won nine games after making the Elite Eight in like the 80s or, or whatnot. The, or, they were an ungodly three and 28. It's not just the worst season by a, an Elite Eight team. It's the fewest wins by a power conference team in the modern era of the tournament. Again, I will say it again. Three and 28. How do you think, how you think, team. how you think Beaver Fever is holding it together? I don't even, I don't think they, I ain't heard from Beaver Fever in a while. Yeah, it's, been, it's been a hot minute, hot month, hot year. Beaver I mean, Fever, if you're listening, hit me up. I just like to know that you're okay. The only team that ever had a worse record after making the tournament, period, was Iona, at least the expanded tournament, 85 and on. Iona in 2006 made the tournament, and the next year went 2-28, and 28, which then led to Kevin Willer taking the job the year after. So, you know, it wasn't the absolute worst season for a, a tournament team, but I got to admit, Oregon State's 233 in Ken Palm. That's too high. Team has zero business clocking in above 290 as far as I'm concerned. They, uh, it is, it is, it, I, you know, I don't think glee in this. It's just, it's just wild, man. They have six freshmen, as you would expect, major roster turnover. No one on this team has D1 experience in averaging more than seven points per game. They open up against Tulsa. They could conceivably lose that, but they will probably win for the first time in 2022. The drought should mercifully end on November 11th when Florida A&M sitting there pretty at 356 preseason Ken Palm. We'll head up to Corvallis. Um, I, Oregon State, can you get to double-digit wins this season? I, you know, I'd love – it'd be it'd be hilarious, actually, if Oregon State went Elite Eight, worst power team – conference team in the country, really worst power conference team in the modern era, and then if they make the tournament. Go ahead. Go do it, Wayne Tinkle. Go ahead. Make the tournament. Prove us wrong. I'd love to see it. The Rattlers are in trouble when they go to Corvallis. You got to think. There's going to be a lot of pent-up stuff there. In all seriousness, like as a staff, like a lot of these players are freshmen, so they weren't like as a coaching staff, like Wayne Tinkle, he has not experienced a victory in close to a year. That's got to be hell, man. And like, how do you not have some level of guilt when you sign like 17, 18 million dollar extension? Well, so it goes. Let's pick know, up. Let's pick some awards. Player of the year, freshman of the year, coach of the year. I usually have been queuing up. I will go first this time. I am going to say. Hawkes is the best player in UCLA, but I'm going to say we will look up. UCLA is going to be in competition for a really, really good seat. Tiger Campbell is going to be awesome, and he's going to win player of the year in the Pac-12. I think he will get it at, at running the point for the best team in the conference. Tiger Campbell is my player of the year, my freshman of the year. Adeem Bona for UCLA. Again, like Bona and Amari Bailey could be 1A, 1B there, but I'm just going to go off the guy who I think looks to be the better player narrowly. So I will go with Bona for freshman of the year. And then coach of the year is a tricky one. Um, if Mick Cronin wins the league, he's going to do it. But I'm going to actually pick Kyle Smith. I, what the hell? I'll do that. I'll say Washington State makes the tournament. And because Washington State qualifies to get into the big dance for the first time within what will be 14 years, that will reality would suggest that will lead to him getting coach of the year. Because if you do that with Washington State, you're going to get coach of the year. So I'll say Wazoo breaks in. Makes it to Dayton, and Kyle Smith wins Coach of the Year. What do you got? Player of the Year, Jami Haquez, UCLA. First team All-American, should be the Player of the Year in the Pac-12. Um, Coach of the Year, McCronin. 
I'm not going to hold it against him that he has put together a great roster. If he wins the Pac-12, I'd vote him Pac-12 Coach of the Year. And Freshman of the Year is Amari Bailey's mother. Oh, gosh. She thick. It's thick 30. It's thick 30. It's thick 30. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think we'd get out of here before that. Before that came up. It's thick 30. It's thick 30 in Westwood. What time is it at Pauley Pavilion? Thick 30. That's your Pac-12 preview. Got a couple quick thoughts on the Carolina. First of all, we're getting the suggestion. Do we do the Virginias? I don't feel like that's even... Like, I was genuinely curious about North Dakota, South Dakota. Okay, then we got set straight. North Carolina, South Carolina. I, I've been to both states. Like at least uh, I have taken trips to both of those states at least 10 times independent of each other in my life. I've been to both states so many times. So uh, Virginia, West Virginia. I mean, I'm not out here looking to offend the Mountaineers. OK, but it doesn't even seem close. Parrish, agree. I'm not going to be disrespectful. Okay of West Virginia, like you're so clearly being. It's it's just Virginia seems to be so obviously better. It depends on what you're looking for, you know, for, before you decide what, 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 what's better, what West looking? Virginia or Virginia, you got to figure out what, what are you looking for? You looking for a great education? You can get in both states. You can get in both states. You sure? Now look what you've done. I'm asking. That's, I'm, I'm, right. I'm asking a question from an honest place. I don't know. Is it true? Can you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think I'll that. Take, I'll take the. I'll take your word for it. Okay. Uh, all right. Couple of things here. I got Depends someone on telling what you're after. You I got to decide what you're I got after. Someone telling me you can't buy alcohol after like 6 p.m. in South Carolina. Nada. Confirm or deny. I do not know the answer to that one but i, it I am i am 100 confident i have drank well past 6 p.m in south carolina no 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 but we're talking like go on to a, a sunday baseball. though on a sunday it's very very likely that used well, to be in is. connecticut by the way you could the the pack they call them package stores in connecticut the package stores closed at eight o'clock and they were always closed on sunday well, they, this is why it. this is why anybody who's um you know gonna have a drink regularly you buy in bulk like I buy, I don't buy, I don't walk into a store and buy a bottle of vodka. I walk into a store and I buy a case of vodka. Like it, I never understand it. Like if you knew somebody who uh, went into Walmart and bought a roll of toilet paper, you'd be like, what are you doing? Why don't you get 20 rolls of toilet paper or eight rolls of toilet paper? Like, why would you buy just one roll? You're going to run out of that roll and then you're going to need another one. Are you going to stop going to the bathroom when this roll's done? Same logic with vodka. Why would you go in and buy a bottle of vodka? Like, are you going, are you just going to drink that bottle? And then you're done. You're done for your life. No, you're probably going to have another bottle. So you stock up on it. Same way you stock up on toilet paper. You should buy vodka at the same bulk that you buy toilet paper or whatever your bottle of choice is. I would never buy just a bottle of vodka ever under any circumstance. That, to me, that's like going to the gas station and getting $3 worth of gas. Just fill it up. All right. The, the thing is, you're making... You're making one point, but you're also making another point when you're doing this. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm going to say. You're making one point, and you're also saying something else. Well, you don't want to have to walk. You run out of one bottle. You got to go back to the store. Then another. You got to go back to the store. Just oh, give me man. six big bottles at a time, and that'll get you, you know, that'll get you through the week. Got a couple of people saying living in North Carolina is the is the answer but if you're going to be a tourist you'd rather visit south carolina which is interesting also someone speaking up for south carolina is saying listen all things being equal south carolina has the clear, clearly the best city of the two states in charleston so that should make it a close race it's you know i'm i'm interested in 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 seeing the cases being made for south carolina that's that's they still got those uh, bathroom uh issues in north carolina thankfully uh, no okay everybody can go to the bathroom wherever they want now Thankfully, yeah. Okay, Th thankfully, we got out of the Stone Age. That's good to hear. Like, hey, they, so both states have made progress. North Carolina allows people to go to the bathroom where they need to go to the bathroom, and South Carolina got rid of that racist flag. Making progress. It's a great point. By the way, if you have if you have a case to make for either, you can always find us 
on social media at Gary Pear CBS at Matt Norlander at I on CBB podcast on Twitter or shouts to CBS at gmail.com. Let us know. I think uh, we settled it though. North Carolina over South Carolina. If you look, if I'm being completely honest, I think North Carolina is the better state, but South Carolina, there's, there's I've had there's some a good lot time. of a, Chester, South Carolina, Devin Downey. I mean, we can't underplay that at the, my Twitter poll right now. We're well north of a thousand votes. It is seventy-five percent North Carolina, by the way. Yeah, I figured. Whew, that is, I think the Dakota one came in seventy thirty. Is South Carolina going to sit there right now, and 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 let it be dominated by North Carolina like this? You going to come? You going to do something about this, South Carolina? Come on now. Everybody in oh, South Carolina is it for twenty years now, though at least. Everybody in South Carolina is sitting in Charleston on porches enjoying coffee this morning. They're not they're not worried about internet polls. They're too busy enjoying how beautiful Charleston is. Probably true. Shouts to Kiwa Island. Shouts. This is gonna be the best shouts yet. Take it away. To Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts That's to right. Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed. Boy. We could have edited about 11 minutes out of this one. <laughs> we, could, shot. we could have got, we could have had this done in 35. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to a podcast, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify and Apple. Please, five stars, leave a nice review. Type some words. There's more of us than there are of them. In fact, if all you do is type there's more of us than there are of them, that's fine. In fact, that's perfect. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you haven't done that yet, we're going to talk to you again real soon. Next up, an SEC preview where the Kentucky Wildcats will try to bounce back from a first-round loss to St. Peter's, playing a high-profile neutral court game against Gonzaga the Sunday before Thanksgiving. I think that's right. We'll talk to you soon. Till then, take care.